Well, good evening and welcome to Kerry Baptist Church. My name is David. I'm one of the ministers here and it's good to welcome you, whether you're worshipping here with us in person uh, at the chapel or whether you're watching online. Uh, This evening, we're continuing our series in the letters addressed to the churches in Revelation, uh, looking tonight at the letter to the church in Thyatira. A couple of things to draw your attention to. We have a 321 course that's running. It started last Wednesday. Uh, it'll run for the next two Wednesday evenings. That's at 7.30 on Zoom. Uh, if you didn't join that last week, but you would still like to join it, you're very welcome to do that. Uh, and if you want the Zoom details, then please contact Richard Baxter, uh, his email uh, address. You can find perhaps uh, on the church website or send an email to the church office uh, and we'll get those details to you. Next Sunday morning, 10.30 here uh, in the chapel, we have a guest service and we're thinking of the question, can I really have a secure hope? Uh, This has been a time when maybe we felt very uncertain uh, with the pandemic. Uh, Where does our hope lie? Can we have a hope that is secure? Uh, And we'll be looking at that question next Sunday morning, 10.30. Do come along or perhaps invite others to join us either in person or online next Sunday morning. Uh, We had planned a church picnic for Sunday the 4th of July after the morning service uh, with the postponement uh, to the final sort of final, maybe final uh, relaxation of some of the restrictions. Uh, We've had to postpone that uh, and we're planning to have that uh, early in September, probably on the 12th of September, Sunday the 12th of September. Uh, So it won't be happening on Sunday the 4th of July. Well, our first song this evening is a song that encourages us to praise God, uh, to praise God because he is our creator, uh, but also to praise God because he is our savior, our redeemer. Uh, And we're going to um, hear uh, in this hymn, these words that Christ is the one who has defeated every sin uh, and therefore we can cast all our burdens upon him. So here in the chapel, we're going to stand and listen, you at home, Uh, are able to sing along to this song, All Creation, uh, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Well, please be seated and let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord of God Almighty, we acknowledge you to be the creator and the sustainer of life, and so you do deserve the praise of every living creature. And we wish that we could lift up our voices here in the chapel and sing your praise, that we would truly adore you and worship you, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We come before you, we thank you that we have even more reason to praise you, because not only are you our creator, but also you are our redeemer, our savior. You are the one who has so worked in history, in time, uh, to reconcile us to yourself, for we each have turned away from you. We have sought to live life according to our own ways. We have turned away from you. We have neglected you, rejected you. We have paid little attention towards you. But Father, we thank you that in your compassion you have looked down upon us and you have sent your Son, God the Son, into this world. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to come to become a man, to live here on earth, to live as we live, uh, to suffer, to die upon the cross, there bearing the penalty for sin, so that all who trust in you, everyone who trusts in you, Lord Jesus, might have their sins fully forgiven. Uh, thank you that you have, Lord Jesus Christ, defeated every sin. And thank you then that we can cast all our burdens upon you. Thank you that you rose from the dead. Thank you that you've triumphed over death itself. Uh, thank you that you are a living, risen, glorified, reigning Lord. Uh, and we thank you that one day you will return. And on that day, then every creature will bow its knee and declare that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your activity and your ministry in the lives of everyone who loves the Lord Jesus and follows him. Thank you that you are working in us uh, to make us more as we should be, uh, helping us to uh, turn away from living sinfully and selfishly, uh, helping us that we might uh, live more in accordance with uh, what is true and right and good and pure. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would continue to work in us, that we might be more like well, more like the Lord Jesus Christ as we see him revealed. We pray too, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, equip us then that we might serve, that we might be those who are witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that we might speak uh, with courage and with confidence uh, about our Savior. So, Lord God, we come to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, asking that you would meet with us this evening as we are gathered here uh, to worship you, to hear your word. Help us to be attentive. Uh, help us to give full attention to your word as it is read and explained to us. Thank you that you speak through your word. And we pray for that ministry of the Holy Spirit to take your word and to apply it to our lives, uh, to help us then as, as you speak truth and love uh, into our lives, that we would respond to that, uh, that we would respond in faith, in love, uh, and in fuller obedience. Uh, be with us, uh, help us, uh, help us as we come to you. Help us to come confessing our sinfulness, our faults and failings, uh, openly acknowledging those before you, coming humbly, repentant, uh, wanting you to so work in us that uh, we might know the forgiveness of all our sins, that we might know that we're brought into relationship with you through Christ, uh, and then that we might live better for your glory. Hear us and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our reading this evening is from the New Testament, from the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, uh, and Catherine Savage, one of our church members, is going to come uh, and read that to us. Thank you, Catherine. Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write... These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, 
By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immortality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Our next song is a song that really expresses our desire to live out our lives dependent on God's grace uh, and that we would look to God uh, that he might keep our hearts uh, and that he would guard our souls uh, against evil. It's the song, O Great God of Highest Heaven. So here in the chapel we'll stand uh, and let's listen to this song. Be seated. 
Well, if you have a Bible, then please do turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Uh, and this evening we're looking at verses 18 uh, to verse 29. Uh, here we have the letter to the church in Thyatira. Uh, this is the fourth of seven letters uh, addressed to individual churches in the Roman province of Asia. Uh, and even though these seven letters were written to actual churches at the time, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, they still have relevance and application uh, to the church today. Indeed, they have relevance and application to the church throughout all of time. And so as we read them, we are doing two things. Firstly, we're wanting to identify what are the features uh, of a church that the Lord Jesus Christ approves of. What are the things that Jesus commends about each of these churches? What are the uh, characteristics uh, of a church that is going well, uh, a church that is honoring Christ? Uh, that's the first thing. What does the Lord Jesus, as he writes these letters, what does he approve of? And then secondly, we want to see what are the aspects of the life of these churches uh, that are not commended? Uh, what are some of the dangers that are identified? What are some of the wrong things that they are doing that they need to repent of? Uh, where, perhaps, uh, are they making mistakes? Uh, where do they need to bring their congregational life more into conformity with God's word? Uh, what are those pitfalls that are threatening uh, the spiritual well-being uh, of the church? Well, this is the fourth letter. The first letter, the letter to the church in Ephesus, taught us that love is to be the heartbeat of the church. Uh, in the second letter, the letter addressed to Smyrna, uh, we saw that suffering is characteristic of the church. In the third letter, the letter to Pergamon, uh, we saw there that truth matters. Truth is important. Uh, truth matters. Well, tonight we're looking at what is the longest of the seven letters, but it's actually addressed to the smallest of the seven cities. Uh, and this is the letter addressed to the church in Thyatira. Now, what do we know about Thyatira? Well, it was a prosperous place. It was a commercial center. Uh, it had a large number of trade guilds. Uh, that's a bit like trade unions. There were trade guilds in Thyatira uh, for bakers and bronze workers uh, and copper makers and weavers and tanners and potters and cobblers and clothiers. Uh, lots of various industries that were taking place in the city of Thyatira. Thyatira is mentioned in only one other place in the New Testament. Uh, I wonder whether you know that is, where that is. It's in Acts chapter 16, where we read of the Apostle Paul in Philippi. Uh, and the Apostle Paul meets a woman called Lydia. Uh, and we read in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, that the Lord opened her heart to the message that Paul and his companions were preaching. She became a Christian uh, and she was baptized. Uh, that woman, Lydia, we're told, was originally from Thyatira uh, and she was engaged in uh, an industry of uh, purple cloth, a uh, clothier, uh, cloth that was dyed purple. Now, we've already noted as we've worked our way through some of these letters that each of the letters begins by picking up uh, one of the details or a couple of details from the opening vision of the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ that we find in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, and that's the case here in the letter to Thyatira. So the letter to Thyatira begins in verse 18 with, this, uh, with, with this, uh, these words. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like, burning, uh, like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. If you turned over to Revelation chapter 1, verses uh, 14 and 15, you'll find a very similar description there uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, his feet like bronze uh, glowing in a furnace. Uh, well, what does the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the, the one with the blazing eyes, uh, what does he say to the church in Thyatira? Well, essentially, he says what he says to all seven churches. He says, I know you. I know your situation. I know what's happening in the church. Uh, I know what's going on. Uh, later in this letter, in verse 23, the Lord will remind this church that he is the one who searches hearts and minds. 
the one with the penetrating gaze, who's able to search hearts and minds, who sees behind the outward, who knows what's going on inwardly. Well, what does the Lord Jesus know about the church in Thyatira? Well, let's look firstly at what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ commends about the church. And Jesus commends the church in Thyatira because it is active and growing. And we'll see this in verse 19. It's a church that is growing and a church that is active. Uh, the church in Thyatira is flourishing. Uh, Jesus says to them in verse 19, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Here is a community of God's people where their faith is being put into action, where they're known for their faith and their love. They're known for their service. They're working hard in service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're persevering in that, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard. They're persevering in serving the Lord. They're working hard. And notice that these hallmarks of a flourishing church are present to an ever-increasing degree. Uh, there in verse 19, uh, the Lord Jesus says to them, you are now doing more than you did at first. Uh, over time, these Christians are more active in their faith than they were uh, when they were first converted, when this church was first planted. They're doing more than they did at first. Now, you might remember the letter to the church in Ephesus, the first letter. And one of the complaints that the Lord Jesus had about the church in Ephesus was that they had forsaken their first love. And he urges them to repent and to redo what they did at first. Uh, Ephesus was a church where they were doing less than they were doing originally. But here in Thyatira, here's a church that is doing more than they did at first. They're active. They're working hard. They're doing more than they did at first. They're active and they are growing. Well, isn't that something that we would want to aspire to as a church? That it might be said of us that we're a church that is active and a church that is growing. Are we a church that is characterized like Thyatira by our love and our faith? by our service and our perseverance? Are we actively living out the Christian faith? And then also, can it be said of us that we are doing more than we did at first? Now, that might be something that's a little bit difficult to think about at the present time because uh, so much uh, restriction is in place and we're not able to do even what we were doing 18 months ago. But in general terms, are we doing more as time goes on? reaching further, perhaps reaching deeper uh, into the communities uh, that we're placed in? Are we a church that is growing in our activity and in our service uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ? And what about us as individual Christians? It's okay to think of it perhaps corporately as a church, but what about us as individual Christians? Are these things true of us? Here's some personal diagnostic questions uh, perhaps to assess your spiritual well-being. Uh, we were thinking this morning about our commitment to Christ. Uh, here are some questions based on what is said about the church in Thyatira that we might measure uh, or assess our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, are you growing in faith? Is your faith growing or is your faith stagnating? Is your love for God and for others increasing? Or is it diminishing? Are you persevering in faith and service as they were in Thyatira? Or do you feel like giving up? Or maybe you, you've stepped back already. Are you serving the Lord? Are you pressing on eagerly in your Christian life? Are you seeking to make progress in your Christian life? Or are you simply plodding along? The Lord Jesus Christ commends this church, the members of this church, for their faith, their love, their service, their perseverance, that they're doing more than they did at the beginning. Well, is that true of us? Of us as a church? And of us as individual Christians? The Lord Jesus Christ commends the church in Tharatara because it's active and because it's growing. So there's much to commend the church in Tharatara uh, but there is also a serious problem in the church. 
And you'll see that addressing this significant problem in the church really occupies the majority of the letter. Commendation in verse 19, uh, but then in verses 20 to 25, uh, Jesus warns the church. Uh, and Jesus warns the church because it tolerates false teaching. Uh, look at verse 20. In verse 20, Jesus says this, Nevertheless, Despite that commendation, despite all those things that are going well in the church, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. The church in Thyatira is facing a very similar threat to the church in Pergamon, that third letter that we looked at the last time. It's all related to the eating of food that's been sacrificed to idols and the adoption of pagan practices, uh, much of that involving sexual immorality. Verse 22 speaks here of people committing adultery uh, with this Jezebel. Now, that may be metaphorical rather than actual. Uh, in verse 20 and verse 24, it's the teaching uh, of this woman that... Uh, uh, is the danger. It's her teaching. And uh, you'll see then that uh, Jesus here may well, be, may well be referring really to spiritual adultery. The church is to be the bride of Christ. The church is to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, her Savior. And if the church turns away and gives her love to someone else, to another God, to another idol, then it's as if they're being adulterous. Perhaps that's what is meant here when it speaks of committing adultery with this Jezebel, listening to her teaching that is drawing them away from faithful love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jezebel is probably not the real name of this um, self-styled prophetess. Uh, probably the name Jezebel is used to draw a parallel between what is happening in the church in Thyatira and what was happening, well, thousands of years before, about a thousand years or so before, uh, amongst the, the nation Israel, uh, when one of their kings, King Ahab, married Jezebel. Uh, and Jezebel, we read about her in 1 Kings, chapters 16 to 21 uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and there we're told that Jezebel was the daughter of a man named Ethbal. Uh, he was the king of Sidon. Uh, and you can tell from his name uh, that he was a worshiper of Baal, the Canaanite god of fertility. Uh, and this is his daughter Jezebel, also a worshiper of Baal. Uh, Jezebel married Ahab. Uh, Ahab was the king of Israel. And she led Israel into the spiritual adultery of idolatry. They began to worship Baal. Rather than worshiping the one true God who had rescued them uh, out of slavery in Egypt and brought them into the, the land of promise, they were now turning away and worshipping this Canaanite deity. And that was Jezebel's influence. And she sought to get rid of the prophets of God. She tried to have Elijah killed unsuccessfully. She was active in promoting idolatry. So it appears then that there's a woman in the church in Thyatira who claims to be a prophet. And she's endangering the Lord's people. She's endangering the church by her false teaching. In verse 24, it speaks about deep secrets. Uh, it seems that this woman was claiming to reveal deep secrets. Maybe that she had had direct communication with God and there were things that had been revealed to her that nobody else knew. Uh, and so she was bringing these hidden deep secrets uh, to the church. But you'll see in verse 24 that the Lord Jesus says that those so-called deep secrets are really satanic in origin. They're not from God, but they've come from the enemy of the church. This prophetess is leading the church astray by encouraging them to worship other gods. Now, in verse 21, the Lord says that he's given time for her to repent but she's unwilling. She continues to mislead the church. And then in verse 22, the Lord warns that if she does not repent, then she will suffer. And those who follow her false teaching will suffer also. This is a serious warning. There's a need to repent of this false teaching. 
And yet we can catch a glimpse here of the Lord's patience, for the door of repentance is still open. Uh, Look at verse 22. Jesus says, I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. There's the open door, unless they repent of their ways. They're going astray. They're doing what is wrong. But here's the offer of repentance, that they can return. If they would repent of their sin, then they can return and come back to God. The door of repentance is still open, but only for a time. For if they do not repent, then God's judgment will follow. Notice also that there's a word of encouragement for those in the church, perhaps the majority, we don't know, but perhaps the majority who are continuing to remain true to the faith. Uh, those who are holding on to the truth. Uh, And so in verse 25, the Lord urges them to hold on to what they have until he comes. Uh, Jesus exhorts them to hold on to what is true. Hold on to the gospel. Hold on to that good news that promises salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Do not loosen your grip on the gospel. Hold on to the truth. There's the exhortation. You know, that's an exhortation that we find often in the New Testament, addressed time and again by the apostles, churches, Christians being told to hold on to the truth. It's so easy to relax our our, our grasp. Let me give you some examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul writing verses 1 and 2. He says this, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you read on there in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about what are those essentials of the gospel, the good news. It's about Jesus Christ coming and being crucified, dying and then rising again. And this is all in accordance with the scriptures. And salvation comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul had preached in Corinth. It was really the foolishness of the cross that he had preached. He had urged people to turn from their living sinfully and selfishly, living for themselves, repenting of their sin and putting their trust and hope in Jesus who was crucified, Jesus who suffered and died on the cross so that those who believe in him might have every sin forgiven that they might have eternal life. And Jesus says, hold on to this. Hold on to these truths. These are the truths that save. If you don't hold on to these truths, then you'll have believed in vain. Hold on to the truth. We find the same exhortation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. There Paul writes and says, So then, brothers, stand firm. And hold on to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. Paul writing to Timothy, a younger man engaged in ministry, and Paul says to him, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Uh, Timothy, I've passed on to you this this, um, deposit of truth. Guard it. Um, Ask for the Holy Spirit's help uh, that you might guard it and hold on to it. And that you might preach it and proclaim it to others. Hold on to the truth. And then in Jude verses 3 and 4. Uh, Jude writes, dear friends, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Why do they need to contend for the faith? For certain men have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And we're catching just the same exhortation in this letter to Thyatira. Uh, The Lord Jesus is urging them, exhorting them to hold on to what is true and not to tolerate what is false. Notice in verse 20 that it's the church's toleration of the false teacher, of this false prophet 
that provokes the Lord's condemnation. He says this, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Maybe the church is aware that there's a problem, but they don't want to deal with it. They'd rather just keep the peace. They don't want to cause a disturbance in the church. Everything else seems to be going so well. Let's focus on the positives. Now, of course, toleration is a, a real buzzword in this modern age. We're urged to be tolerant of different races and cultures, and so we should be. But we're also encouraged to be tolerant and affirming of different worldviews, however mutually contradictory they might be. And to be tolerant and affirming of different lifestyles, however unconventional they may be. Well, here the church in Thyatira is told not to tolerate false teaching. We're not to tolerate teaching that is false. We're not to tolerate behavior that is sinful. There are things that we must hold on to. There are things that we must not tolerate. And what the letter to the church in Thyatira is teaching us is that being known and characterized by our faith and our love, by our service and our perseverance, is not enough. Those are good things, but they're not enough. We must also hold on to what is true. We must not tolerate what is false. We need to be faithful to the Lord. We need to be faithful to God's word. Just imagine for a moment a wife who buys expensive presents for her husband. She buys those expensive presents on those special days on his birthday and at Christmas. She frequently tells him that she loves him. She enjoys time with her husband every weekend. But just imagine if all of that is true, and yet in the workplace, she openly flirts with other men. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we commit ourselves to love Jesus faithfully, to forsake all others that we might follow him, love him, follow him, and serve him. Now, every weekend, perhaps, we can be in church. And when there's no pandemic, we can sing praise to the Lord Jesus. We can pray to him. We can give generously of our time and our money. And yet, maybe during the week, maybe in our workplaces, maybe in our homes, we openly flirt with the world. Are we faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what was the situation that was happening here in Tharatara? Well, it was all to do with eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols, worshipping pagan deities, uh, that leading then to sexual immorality. Now, perhaps that's not a temptation that we face, the eating food sacrificed to idols, worshipping pagan deities. But there are many other ways, aren't there, in which we're tempted to flirt with the world. Many other ways in which we're tempted not to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many ways in which we can compromise with the world. Many ways in which we can loosen our grip on the truth and begin to tolerate what is false. See, yes, as Christians, we are to be actively engaged with the world. The Lord Jesus himself urges us that we are salt and light in the world. He urges us to be witnesses to the world. Yes, we're to be actively engaged in the world, but we're not to march to the world's tune. And we're not to adopt the world's ways. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. And any teaching that encourages us to compromise the word of God and to embrace the world's ungodly ways must not be tolerated. That's what was happening in Thyatira. They were tolerating false teaching and it would draw them away, it would lead them astray. Now, of course, the appeal of the false teaching was that it might make things easier for the Christians in Thyatira. We heard earlier that it was a city that had many trade guilds. If you were a tradesperson in Thyatira, then you would want to belong to one of the trade guilds, one of the trade unions. 
it would be important to do that for then you would have the opportunity to be engaged in, in winning contracts and in doing business in the city. But every trade guild would have had a, a pagan patron god, someone to be worshipped, someone to be honoured, someone that you would have to give gifts to and make sacrifices to. And you can just imagine the Christians in Tharatara. It would be so much easier for them, wouldn't it, if they just went along with that? There would be less severe economic consequences for them. But they're urged to be faithful to God. Faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. And not to be drawn away from him. You know, faithful allegiance to Jesus can be costly. It, it was costly in the days in which these letters were written, when many Christians were facing hostility, opposition, even persecution. But being faithful to the Lord Jesus is costly even today. Don't we know it? Being faithful to Jesus is costly today. So the letter to the church in Thyatira urges us to hold firmly to what is true, hold on to the gospel, that gospel that was preached to them, that they'd come to believe, that they'd responded to, to hold firmly onto the truth and not to let it go, not to tolerate false teaching that would draw them away from the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus commends the church for her faith and love and service and perseverance. She's an active, growing church. But the Lord Jesus also warns the church because she's tolerating false teaching. But then thirdly and finally in this letter, we see the Lord Jesus encouraging the church. And how does he encourage the church? Well, he encourages the church with the prospect of a glorious future. This happens in all these letters. The Lord Jesus at the end urges the church to look ahead in time, to lift their heads up and to look to the future. And sets before them a glorious future. We see this in verses 26 to 28. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus applies Psalm 2 to himself to remind the Christians in Thyatira that he has authority over the nations. He is sovereign over all the kings and over all the peoples of the world. Jesus is the great king. And he will ultimately triumph over all his enemies. And Jesus promises that those who overcome trials and troubles because they're trusting in him, because they're faithful to him, will also share in his triumph. They will share in his authority. And that should be a great encouragement to them. And then in verse 28... Jesus also promises that those who overcome and do his will to the end, he will give them the morning star. The morning star. What is the morning star? The planet Venus is sometimes called the morning star because sometimes it appears just over the horizon just before dawn. If you see the planet Venus in the sky just above the horizon, then you know that the dawn is coming. Night is almost over and the new day is about to begin. And later in Revelation, right towards the end, the last chapter, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, Jesus himself is described as the bright morning star. Jesus is the bright morning star. Jesus is the one, of course, who has conquered death. He's the one who rose from the grave. He's the one who ushers in a new day. He is the one who announces that the darkness of sin and death is dispelled, that a new day is coming, a new age is coming. And he's the first, and many more will follow after him. Jesus is the bright morning star. Those who trust him, well, they will join with him as he inaugurates that new, that new age when he returns. For Jesus is returning. The Jesus who came, who was born as the baby in Bethlehem, who died on the cross, who rose from the grave, who ascended back into heaven, will one day return. And when he comes, he will gather his people to himself. 
there will be resurrection, there will be eternal life, there will be a new creation, there will be a new age. The darkness is over and the light has come. Jesus here is holding out to these believers that prospect of a new day, of a glorious future that he will usher in when he returns. And you know, this is why as Christians, we persevere. It's why we press on, as why we hold on to the truth, despite hostility, despite opposition, despite persecution, despite temptation, despite trials, because it will all be worth it in the end. It will all be worth it when Jesus Christ returns. And you know, really, that's the message of the whole book of Revelation. Yes, there will be trials. There will be troubles. And there will come a time when those will become really intense and Christians will be persecuted. But hold on, because Jesus is returning. That's how Revelation ends. That's how the book of Revelation ends. That Jesus is coming. And it ends with really that prayer, come Lord Jesus. We're looking forward to his return. Why do we hold on to the truth? Even when it brings opposition, hostility, persecution, temptation and trials. Because Jesus is the key. And he will come. And when he comes, then every knee will bow before him. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord now. Come to him, trust in him, follow him, follow him faithfully. And look forward to his coming. The letter to the church in Tharatara. Jesus commends the church because it's active and growing. Jesus warns the church because they're tolerating false teaching. And then Jesus encourages the church by holding out to them the prospect of a glorious future. Well, let's listen to another song and then we'll close our service in prayer. This third song that we're going to listen to is a a song that says, he will hold me fast. We've been thinking this evening of how we need to hold fast to the truth. Uh, but it's wonderfully reassuring, isn't it, to know that the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, who describes himself as the truth, he's the one who holds on to us. Uh, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, there is no one that can snatch us out of the hands of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. So he will hold us fast. Even as we're urged and encouraged to hold on to the truth, he's the one who's holding on to us. Let's stand and listen to this song.
Please be seated and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for what we've read this evening in Revelation chapter 2, this letter addressed to the church in Thyatira. We thank you for the encouragement and the challenge that this letter is to us. Father, we would desire that we would have a faith that is active and a faith that is persevering and a faith that is growing, a faith that is more active as the days go by. Father, we pray that you would help us to make progress in our Christian lives. Help us not just to be those who plod along. And Father, we pray that you would help us to hold on to what is true. Uh, Give us that ability to discern what is true. Thank you that your word is truth. Thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is truth personified. And we pray that we would look ever to him, that we would know him to be our savior, that we might be trusting him, that we would be following him, that we would be serving him, that he would be our Lord and master. Father, we pray that uh, you would help us, that we uh, would be aware of anything that might draw our hearts away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that the world presses in so much against us, and it would be so easy just to give in and to go with the flow. Father, we pray that we would resist that temptation. We pray, too, that you would be at work by your Holy Spirit. We know that we have sinful natures and we have this tendency to to turn away from you. And so we pray that you would help us, that we might be those who are frequently reading your word, reminding ourselves of the truth, and that your Holy Spirit would be impressing it upon our hearts and minds, reassuring us that truly we are your dearly loved children, loved through Jesus Christ. Father, we recognize that it is easy for us, perhaps, to to feel that uh, our faith might fail. And there is so much that we encounter in life that is painful, so much that is a trial to us, so much that is uh, troubling, so much that is a temptation to us. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us, that uh, we would be those who, who know you holding us fast, Uh, Father, we thank you for that promise that is given, that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from your love towards us in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we are held safe in your your hands. Father, we pray for our own responsibility that we might hold on to what is true, that we might continue faithfully to follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would keep us in Uh, walking in in those ways of holiness and righteousness. Uh, Father, we pray that we would turn away from what is false and what is wrong, what is uh, dishonoring to you. Uh, Father, we pray for that wholehearted commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, that that might be lived out day by day in our lives. Uh, Father, we want to pray for those in our congregation, perhaps, who especially need to know that, that you are near and that you are holding them fast because perhaps their faith might well fail. Father, we pray that you would draw near to those who are struggling, for those who are suffering. Father, we think of those who are undergoing treatment presently. We pray again for little Noah Guest, and we do pray that the treatment that he's undergoing would be effective in clearing infection and then dealing with the cancer in his little body. Father, we pray particularly for Jeff and Ishan. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would strengthen their faith, that they'd continue to trust you. Father, it's so hard for them watching and looking on and seeing their, their little son suffering so. Father, we pray that you would draw near, sustain, and support them, we pray, through these difficult times. Father, we pray for Janice as she has a week of tests and scans and consultations up in Oxford. We do pray that you continue to recover from the last cycle of chemo. We pray that the scan would indicate that there is real progress being made in attacking the cancer. We pray, Father, for good news from that consultation. We pray that you be with Pete and Janice as they travel up and down to Oxford this week. Father, we pray for others, perhaps with needs that are hidden from us or not known by us. Father, in so many ways, we, we struggle, probably struggling with What's happening presently with the pandemic, maybe struggling with our mental health, 
struggling with frustration at the continuation of these restrictions, uh, maybe difficulties in family life, concern about parents or children. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us, whatever we're struggling with, that we might know your presence. Uh, we pray that you would hold us fast, hold us close to yourself. Help us to hold on to your promises. Thank you that we have many promises written down in your word, and we thank you that you are faithful to every promise that you have made. And Father, we pray too that we would have that assurance of your continuing, constant, faithful, dependable, reliable love towards us. And thank you that that has been expressed already in Jesus Christ and continues to be expressed day by day. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us that we might be those who grow in love and grow in faith, that you would fill our hearts with peace and joy and hope. Thank you for the glorious hope that we have as those who follow Christ that one day the risen, ascended, reigning, glorious Jesus will return and he will usher in, inaugurate a new age, a new world, a new creation where there is no more sin, sorrow and suffering and sickness, where there is no more death. And Father, we thank you then that the complete darkness will have been eliminated and the light, the light of life will have come in all its glory. And Father, we pray that you would help us, that we would keep that hope before us, and that that would strengthen and help us day by day as we seek ever to live for your glory and for the honour of Christ, our Saviour. Father, we pray that you would be with us, watch over us as we go from this place, that we might continue to grow in your grace and that we might serve and honour you as we should, as you work in us by your Spirit. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening here in the chapel, joining us online. Uh, do join us again next Sunday, 10.30 in the morning, a guest service uh, looking at the question, can I really have a secure hope? But that's all for now. Good night.